Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, our topic for this episode is Asian philosophy, or better yet, philosophies found in Asia. Now, in philosophy, we study metaphysics, the nature of reality, epistemology, the nature and limits of human knowledge, and ethics, the nature of morality. Now, we learn what the great philosophers have said about these matters through the works of Plato and Aristotle, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, the modern philosophers Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, Bartley, Hume, and Kant, and everyone who came after Hegel. But the canon of philosophy is dominated by philosophers from the West. What of the Taoists? What of the works of the Confucians and the Buddhists? What could these philosophies found in Asia offer us, and would they even matter? Now, joining us to discuss these philosophies of ease, we have Graham Priest, Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So hello, Graham. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi, JJ. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, so before we get, the, we get into the main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. So how do you get started in philosophy? Well, uh, I was trained as a mathematician. Um, my doctorate is in mathematics, actually in mathematical logic. And uh, mathematical logic is closely connected with many issues in philosophy. By the time I finished my doctorate, I, I realized two things. The first, that I was never going to be a very good mathematician. And the second was that philosophy was a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tried to get a job in a philosophy department, and to my surprise I was successful. And um, uh, I've never looked back since then. It's been an enormous amount of fun. <laughs> I mean, since I had very little knowledge of philosophy, uh, I've spent my whole philosophical life educating myself. And it's been a blast. Okay, so you, you were born in the UK, but you moved to Australia. So what, what was that move about? Yeah, correct. So uh, I finished my doctorate, and that was at the LSE. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I applied for lots of jobs. Uh, and um, I was offered two temporary jobs. One was in the math department at City University. One was in the philosophy department at St. Andrews. And for me, it was a no-brainer. I went to St. Andrews. <laughs> and of course, that, well, that was a temporary job. Um, and I carried on applying for jobs in the UK uh, and elsewhere. And um, no one seemed to want to offer me a job. The first permanent job I was offered was at the University of Western Australia in Perth in Australia. Um, and since it was the only permanent job I was offered, I, I took it and I moved with my family to oh. Australia. And we thought we'd be back in the UK for a few years, in a few years. Um, that turned out not to be the case. We'd actually emigrated, although I didn't realize that for a number of years. Um, so most of my working life, I've, I've uh, lived in Australia. I, I was offered a job here in the US um, about um, 11 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I moved here, but uh, I, I'm not an American. And <laughs> when, I, when I hang my philosophical boots up, as it were, I intend to go back to Australia. Australia is a country I love very much. It's got problems like most countries. But um, I, I like Australian people. They're very friendly and no nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, philosophically, moving to Australia was um, was a really good move for me, it turned out in retrospect, because Australian philosophy has two great, well, the way Australians do philosophy has two virtues. First of all, uh, it's very open-minded. The attitude is, well, tell us something interesting, let's think about it. Mm -hmm. The second is that it's pretty hard-nosed. People won't take bullshit, okay? So if you th they think what you're saying won't fly, they'll criticise it. So this combination of open-mindedness and hard-nosedness actually is a, very, is a great breeding ground for philosophy. Bad ideas wither very fast. Good ideas get developed. Um, so in retrospect, the move to us was uh, serendipitous. Okay, so you've been moving around in, in many universities, but who or what influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? Um, what is easy 
uh, as I said, I discovered that philosophy was fun. Mm. I mean, it's intellectually engaging, it's challenging. I enjoy thinking about philosophical issues. Um, that's what made me want to be a philosopher, not a mathematician. Um, who is a bit harder. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to know many very good philosophers and of course to read many great philosophers as well. And uh, I think that the impetus of all these things, both the people I know and the people I've read have motivated me to, to go on in philosophy. Okay. So you work mostly in philosophy of mathematics, metaphysics, and logic, the latter of which you have contributed immensely. So how did you get into Asian philosophy? Okay. So coming from my mathematical background, my first interest was the philosophy of mathematics. Um, and that's closely connected with issues in philosophical logic in many ways. And that's closely connected with issues in metaphysics in many ways. So, you know, when you do philosophy, as you probably discover, the topics are kind of entangled. Uh, if you're interested in one thing, it, it's connected with issues in other areas. And so you get interested in those. So over my life, uh, my interests have drifted. I've never lost an interest, but I've gained lots as the kind of network of connections has spread out in my thinking. Uh, so nowadays there are actually very few bits of philosophy that I don't engage, engage with one way or another. Um, the current book manuscript I have is actually on political philosophy, which is a sort of a new development for me. But that was in turn, the interest in that was in turn engendered by my interest in Buddhist ethics. Okay, which brings me to your question of how I got involved in Buddhist ethics, or well, Buddhism generally. So, um, I'd been in the profession for about 20 years and I was starting to think that I had some sense of the area of philosophy. When uh, I met someone who is now a very old friend and we've written a great deal together, Jay Garfield. Mm -hmm. So Jay Garfield um, is an American philosopher, um, although he was had, had the chair in Tasmania in Australia at that time. We met at a conference and we started talking. I just finished uh, Beyond the Limits of Thought which you're showing on the screen. He just finished his translation of Nagarjuna's Mulumba Um And as I talked to him, I, I realized that there, there was so much interesting stuff in the stuff, in what he was doing in Buddhist philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of shocked because it made me realize that there was half the world's philosophy that I knew nothing about. So, you know, Western philosophy, um, stemming from sort of the mi Middle East, Greece, is one thing that Western philosophers know about. But of course, there's Chinese philosophy uh, and Indian philosophy, and, and those, of course, go into many other cultures as well. Um, but India and China have great philosophical traditions, and I was just shocked to discover that they weren't discussed in the West. So um, I made a point of trying to educate myself so I've studied in India and Japan, and I've taught in China and Japan. Um, so that was uh, started about 25 years ago, uh, and I've been slowly educating myself in the Asian traditions. I haven't lost interest in the West, but philosophical, tradition, uh, philosophical problems are so much more rich and more exciting when you have multicultural perspective on these things. Um, you know, the, the, in many problems, Many philosophical problems are, are universal. They crop up in all philosophical traditions. You know, uh, what's the nature of the world? How should one live? Is there a God? How do you know these things? You find those in all philosophical traditions I'm aware of. Um, sometimes philosophers in different... enormously so you know that's how I got into Asian philosophy and what it's done to help me in my philosophical thinking okay so you might say that Jay Garfield ushered you in Asian philosophy now let's turn it to did. yeah let's turn to this it topic. Was not 
it was another bit of serendipity. Okay, <laughs> life is full of these things which influence your life in a way that you might never have imagined. Okay, so here in the Philippines and in Asia, for the longest time, we have learned about. Uh, Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and all the rest of these Asian philosophies. But there's always one objection against these things. They're saying, are these even philosophies or just schools of thought? Mm. So what can you say yeah. about that objection? Yeah. Okay, Look, there, there, there are several things here. First of all, a lot of Asian philosophy is connected with Asian religions. Um, that's obviously true of Buddhism, um, Hinduism. I don't know whether you want to call Confucianism religion, but you might. Um, that does not make it non-philosophical. And you only have to think about medieval uh, Western philosophy, uh, which was closely connected with Christianity. Okay. So the fact that you have religious connections does not mean it's not philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, that uh, religions themselves are multifaceted things. They have um, canonical texts, they usually have a priesthood, they have sacred rites, practices, places and so on. Um, but all the great world religions have philosophies. So these are people who engage in the sorts of philosophical problems that um, are sort of generated by the religions. Mm. Now, the fact that the problems are generated by the religions does not mean that they're specific to those religions because uh, many of these problems are fundamental problems about metaphysics and ethics, which transcend narrow religious boundaries. So um, what's always engaged me in the Asian philosophical traditions is the philosophical parts of these religions, um, not the other things. Although, you know, they're kind of interesting on a, for me on a, a lay basis, but there's the philosophical stuff which interests me. Um, final comment. Uh, the view that you're describing was kind of orthodox in Western circles uh, up till about, I guess, 50 years ago. I mean, there have been, were very well-known Western philosophers who took the Indian traditions and the Chinese traditions seriously, such as Hegel and Schopenhauer. But by and large, the dominant view was that these are not philosophy, that these are religion, oracular pronouncements, wise men's sayings, etc., etc. Um, now that view, it must be said, can only be held in ignorance of the texts. Because once you start reading the texts, you see that people are, dis are engaged in philosophical issues. They're arguing with each other. Philosophical arguments are going backwards and forwards. So uh, that view that it's not philosophy, at least in the West, is now lapsing, I think. And very few Western philosophers are prepared to endorse this. But there's still a view that these things are kind of marginal to philosophy. Uh -huh. Uh, that, you know, there are some things which are central to philosophy, like Western history of philosophy, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind. And the other stuff is, you know, just frills. Uh, I, still, I think this is still a very common view in the West, and it's completely wrong, because all the great things uh, in philosophy are discussed in the Asian traditions and argued about in the Asian traditions. Of course, if a Western philosophy picks up an Asian philosophical text, you hit the fact that it's coming from a different culture, it's written in a different language, different assumptions are being made about what can be taken for granted, there are different ways of writing philosophy, and that's a hurdle that a Western philosopher has to jump. Mm -hmm. But even in the West, philosophy is written in many ways, uh, in many languages, in many styles, and you, you get used to reading philosophy uh, coming from different backgrounds, like ancient Greece or medieval Europe or 19th century Germany. Um, so um, if you're interested in philosophy, you should want to jump those cultural and linguistic backgrounds just to explore what's going on the other side. If you don't speak the language, you're going to be limited in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. But hey, you know, philosophy is written in so many languages, even just in Western philosophy. It's written in Greek, Latin, French, German, English. Um, 
you know, very few people, very few Western philosophers speak all those languages. Right. Um, so you have to, if you can't speak the original language, you have to depend heavily on translators and scholars who can, that's fine. As long as you are aware of your limitations, you can work in the traditions. Okay, so I, I'm sensing a pattern here. So what you're saying is that in Asian philosophy, in Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and so on, they're still doing philosophy because they're engaging in a metaphysical dispute or questions about ethics or questions about epistemology. So these are philosophical in nature. Is that what you're saying? Uh, absolutely. So you open the texts of uh, philosophical texts in India or China, you will find people discussing mm -hmm. the nature of reality, um, whether there's a God, how one should live, uh, how one should run the state, how you know all these things. And there are robust debates going on in the, I don't know when you want to say that these traditions start, probably around the same time that Greek philosophy kicks off, that's about two and a half thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there are two things to note about uh, Asian philosophy. There was a radical change in Western philosophy because of the scientific revolution. Oh. And Asian philosophy never made that break. So uh, there was a change in Western philosophy around the 17th century. And that, that change never happened in the East. Um, but that doesn't make what happened in the East obsolete. I mean, obviously, we, we still now talk about philosophical writers in the West uh, before the scientific revolution. You know, Western philosophy is full of Plato, Aristotle, and so on. Um, the second thing is that because of Western cultural imperialism, uh, Eastern philosophers have had to come to terms with the influence of Western philosophy has had on their traditions. So the British Raj brought the, the uh, British traditions to India. Um, uh, the, probably the best known Japanese philosopher of the 20th century, Nishida, uh, was highly influenced by philosophy, uh, Western philosophy. And of course, the influence on Marxism on China hardly needs to be, you know, yeah. So the, because of um, Western imperialism, Asian philosophers over the last couple of hundred years have had to come to terms with Western philosophy and many have sort of brought the Western and Asian in a way that Western philosophers have not done yet. Okay, now the economic and political center of gravity of the world is moving to the East. Clearly, the 21st century will be dominated by China in a way that the 20th century was dominated by the United States. Um, and That's a bold of... claim. That's a bold claim, Graham. <laughs> I stand for it. Okay, <laughs> well, I think we could talk about this if you want, but it would take us off at a, something of a tangent, but I stand by it. Okay. Um, um, and so for many reasons, both intellectual and sort of cultural, um, Western philosophers will engage with Asian traditions. Uh, I think we're in a kind of exciting time in philosophy because uh, whatever you might think about economic globalism, we're, we're entering a phrase, a phrase of global philosophy mm -hmm. where the world's traditions are going to become entangled with each other. And that is a very fruitful time uh, because when philosophical traditions entangle, all kinds of things happen. So when, when Buddhism moves into, from India into China, for example, uh, you get the sort of genesis of Chinese Buddhism, which is a fantastic development. Or when uh, uh, Judaic thought meets Greek thought in, in, uh, in Christian philosophy, you get this sudden flourishing of Christian philosophy. I mean, you know, th these are always really, really exciting times. New ideas emerge. And I, I, th I think we're moving into that kind of area now. So you're seeing Western universities offering more Asian philosophy courses in the future? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, 30 or 40 years ago when I started teaching, uh, there were virtually no courses on Asian philosophy in Western universities. Oh. Um, many Western universities have courses now. I think nearly every university in Australia does. Uh, my own university teaches them occasionally. Um, 
there are still some old and more traditional departments which don't teach, teach courses in Asian philosophy, but more and more courses are being taught. Now, of course, um, not many philosophers know much about it, so they're, they're kind of limited in what can be taught. Um, but you have a chicken and egg problem. Uh -huh. um, if you don't know about it, you can't teach it. If you can't teach it, people don't know about it. And so the cycle propagates itself. But slowly, as people learn more, um, more will be put, people will know more, and more people will want to do right, research on it, publish on it. Um, this is a movement that's slowly underway, and it, it's, it's gaining momentum. Okay, so let's have a bird's eye view first of Asian philosophy. So how should we understand the, these philosophies in terms of their overall themes, methods, and ways of philosophizing? Yeah. Look, that, that's sort of an impossible question to answer. Mm -hmm. Just think about the corresponding question for Western philosophy. Now, tell me about Western philosophy. What makes it tick? Uh, what, what's essential to it? Yeah. Look, there are many, many Western philosophers. Plato is not Nietzsche. Wittgenstein is not Heidegger. Kant is not Kripke. Look, uh, in the same way, there are many, many different Asian philosophical traditions. Um, so you can't say, well, there's one thing that holds the whole lot together. Um, okay. So, so, yeah, that's fair enough. So let's get into one of your areas of research. You have done a ton of research in Buddhist philosophy. And what's interesting about your work is that you're comparing and contrasting some salient Buddhist idea with ideas found in Western philosophy. So let's do some comparative philosophy, shall we? Okay. So, let, so let's start with the Buddhist idea of sunyata or emptiness. Mm -hmm. I think that you explored this in your works, in particular this latest, uh, one of your latest works, one. So can you spell out this idea for us, sunyata? Okay. So shunya means empty. Shunyata, emptiness. Um, and I think often this is under, misunderstood. Um, let, let's do a little bit of historical backtracking. Um, a major topic in Buddhist philosophy is the nature of reality. And um, Buddhism develops in an early form, if by about 500 years in India. And what emerges are called the Abhidharma tradition of philosophy. And they have very distinctive metaphysics. According to them, um, there are two sorts of reality. There's a conventional reality, which is the world we're familiar with, the Lebensworld. And there's a kind of an ultimate reality that is what really is there in reality. Now, in the Abhidharma tradition, Ultimate reality is composed of things called dharmas. You can think of those as metaphysical atoms. Mm -hmm. And conventional reality is a kind of conceptual construction out of these. In a way that you might think that, um, well, a chariot is a conceptual construction out of its parts, its axles, its wheels, and so on. That's a standard analogy. But ultimate reality is composed by these dharmas. These things are metaphysical atoms, and they have... They are what they are in and of themselves. Oh. The Sanskrit word is svapalva, self-being. So it's okay. like a substance in Greek philosophy? Pretty much, oh. pretty much, yeah. Now, there's a sort of revolution in Buddhist thinking, which arises around the turn of the common era, when a slightly later form of Buddhism emerges. Not that the older form disappears, you know, it's still there, but... Um, in the, the new form is called Mahayana. Mahayana has differences from the older tradition, both ethical and metaphysical. But let's concentrate on the metaphysical stuff. Um, the most important early Mahayana writer was a philosopher called Nagarjuna, um, who influenced all Mahayana philosophy thereafter, both Indian and Chinese and Japanese. And he in his text, the Mulamadhyamaka Karaka, which is one of the great works of philosophy, he um, launches a swinging attack on the older metaphysical 
uh, view. So what he argues is that there are no such things as these dharmas, these things which have self-being. Um, so everything is empty, shunya. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. What it means is, if, if something's empty, it's empty of something. My glass is empty of beer, right? <laughs> to be empty is to be empty of something. And what things are empty of is sabhava, self-being. There's nothing which has self-being. And what, the, what this means roughly is that things, there's nothing which is what it is in and of itself. Everything is what it is in virtue of its relations to other things. So this is a highly relational ontology, if you want to call it that. Um, so uh, that's the view, that's Nagarjuna's view of reality. Everything is empty. Now, that's relatively easy to get your head around. Yeah. It gets kind of complicated after that because you might have think, I mean, Nagarjuna operates with this distinction between conventional and ultimate reality. It, it's everywhere in, in Buddhism. Um, and you might think that having disposed of the dharmas, these things with Svapava, he'd have given up the notion of empty, uh, of ultimate reality. And he doesn't. He's quite explicit about that. So uh, conventional reality is what it is. Have they always been, namely our Lebensworld. Um, what the hell is ultimate reality now? Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's where it gets murky. And this has caused great debates in Buddhist philosophy ever since Nagarjuna. Um, but he uses this word shunyata, emptiness, for what he takes to be ultimate reality. Uh -huh. And then you know, there's a big question about what shunyata, as opposed to shunya, is. And many, uh, many of the traditions that spin off Nagarjuna, and I think Nagarjuna himself, but that's contentious, takes it to be something which is ineffable. Oh. Um, and so following Nagarjuna, you get uh, discussions of an ineffable ultimate reality in, in Buddhist philosophy. When, when, when Buddhism goes into China, this kind of morphs into Buddha nature which plays an enormous role in Chinese philosophy, especially Zen, or to go to its Chinese name, Chan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm trying to get, wrap my head around uh, the concept here. So you have the Abhidharma uh, Buddhism, which has this kind of substance ontology. So you have the Dharma as the foundation of ultimate reality, as opposed to the the Garjana type of thinking or ontology that you don't have that Dharma, but you have Sunya. So things are empty because they have to be related to each other. Is Correct. That, yeah. Correct. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, because in one of your interviews and in one of your papers, you actually uh, put an analogy or you use the analogy of Leibniz and Newton to to explain the difference here. Can you tell us something about that as well? Yeah. So, um, if you're meeting the notion of Shunya for the first time, it might be kind of hard to get your head around if you're coming from a Western tradition of Western philosophy. What is it? I mean, things which are Shunya have a relational existence. Mm. Um, now, what does it mean to have a relational existence? Well, um, there's one thing that's well known in Western philosophy, um, uh, and that's debates about the philosophy of time. And the debate between Newton or the Newtonians and Leibniz on the philosophy of time is interesting because uh, Newton held that um, Space and time is a thing in and of itself. It doesn't depend on events that happen in it. It will be there if there were nothing. Space and time are kind of locuses in which things happen, um, but they are what they are independently of any events that happen. In it. Okay, so they, space and time in, or, or moments in space and time, places in space and time, uh, uh, have this kind of self-being. Mm -hmm. 
Le has Van Palmer. Now, um, Leibniz rejected this picture. He wasn't an absolutist about time. He was a relationist. So, um, if you take a, an event in um, time, let, let's say, um, I don't know, um, the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. okay. So 2016, on November 2016, mm -hmm. if you're Newton, that designation, November 2016, refers to a point in space and time, okay, which is what it is, independent of anything that happens. Uh, and Leibniz says, no, uh, look, 2016 is just a marker for um, a set of relations between uh, the things that happened in 2016, the things that happened before 2016, 2000, things that happened after 2016. So 2016 doesn't mean anything in and of itself. It's just a marker for a, a place and a bunch of relations between the events before and after. Mm -hmm. And that, that view is relatively well known in Western philosophy. And it sort of shows the difference between conceptualizing something as having subtrapava and something as being merely relational. So sometimes I've used that analogy to try and get over the notion of relational existence to Western philosophers. Okay, so, but it's, is it the same or is it different from Nagarjuna Sunya, idea of Sunya? Well, the major difference is that, ev that according to Nagarjuna, everything is empty. Everything has merely relational existence. And very few people that I know in the West, in fact, I don't really think of anybody in the West who's endorsed this view. Mm -hmm. uh, Leibniz was certainly, certainly thought there were, that not everything had relational existence. I mean, you know, his theory of monads. Monads are things with subhava par excellence. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you believe in a Western God, uh, God is a thing with subhava par excellence. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, what's so distinct about Nagarjuna is the view that everything is empty. And then, you know, this has various consequences, which he explores. Okay, so finally, about this concept of sunyata. So you have not really given a description of what sunyata is. What, well, there's a description. <laughs> it's an ineffable thing. But what is that? Well, that's a very good question. Look, um, Okay, here's one way of looking at shunyata. Um, our Lebensfeld, our conventional reality, is at least in part a conceptual construction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me that I'm sitting on, what I'm sitting on is a chair, but if you put it in the middle of um, a culture where they didn't have furniture, um, they wouldn't think of it in that way. I mean, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a chair, it would be a strange shaped object. Um, and conceptual construction plays an enormous role in our thinking about the world. You know, nations have no intrinsic existence. You know, they, they, nations are simply nations because we conceptualize places and people in a certain way. So um, a Buddhist uh, is going to say that our conceptual world is a conceptual construction. Um, now, Think about taking reality and peeling off the conceptual overlay. Mm -hmm. So take the chair I'm sitting on and remove its conceptual overlay, this blackness, its four-leggedness, its chairedness. Once you've removed the conceptual overlay, what remains is ultimate reality. What's it like? Well, obviously you can't say, <laughs> because to say would be to employ concepts, and you've stripped all those away. So um, this is kind of one of the arguments which drives the thought in Mahayana Buddhism that ultimate reality is ineffable. So if you ask me what it's like, I can't tell you. Um, that doesn't mean you cannot experience it in the Buddhist tradition. It means you have no knowledge by description. You can have knowledge by acquaintance to use the kind of Rasulian words. Um, 
Yeah, I can't tell you what it's like, but hey, you know, come down to my temple, do my meditation exercises, and you'll experience it. That's that's the story. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the, the fact that it's inevitable doesn't mean you can't experience it. Um, so that, that that's all fine. What's not so fine is this. Look, I told you that ultimate reality is ineffable. Haven't I just been talking about it? I sure have. And so do all the great Mahayana Buddhist philosophers. Mm -hmm. So they're in this situation where they're telling you that something is ineffable and describing it at the same time. Now, they know there's an issue here. It's a contradiction. What do you do? Do you, do you accept the contradiction? That's one possibility. Do you try and defuse it in some way? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, paradoxes and contradictions are everywhere in philosophy, Western philosophy and, and Asian tradition. Um, and often people, when they meet a paradox, try to defuse it. Uh, and there are many standard strategies for this. And you find those in Asia and as much as you do in, in uh, the West. Um, so one of the debates you get in Asian in the Buddhist tradition uh, after Nagarjuna is exactly how to handle this apparent paradox of ineffability. It looks as though you can talk about ineffability. What is one to make of that situation? Okay, so before we get into that, let's proceed first to Buddhist ethics, which mm -hmm. the idea of karuna or compassion, which you explored in your paper, uh, Compassion in the Net of Indra. Uh, which was published in this book. So what is this notion all about, the notion of Karuna? Okay. Uh, okay, first of all, the word, Karuna. Um, standard translation is compassion. That's a somewhat problematic translation because compassion sounds a bit passive, uh -huh. suffering with, okay? Whereas Karuna is actually a very active thing. It's taking steps to um, of benevolence and beneficence towards other people. <coughs> um, Amber Carpenter suggested to me that care is a better translation. I think that's probably right. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, to care about things, you, you can't, if you, if, you, if you say, I care about you and you do by all, uh, it just shows you're not speaking the truth, right? To care, you've actually got to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And Karuna is active in this way. However, the, the, the standard translation of Karuna is compassion. Let, let, let's stick with that, but just remember my warning. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the core ethical principles of Buddhism, which goes right back to the original teachings of the Buddha, is that life is characterized by and then there's one of these Sanskrit words, which is hard to translate, dukkha, um, Sanskrit or Pali. Um, usually it's translated to suffering, uh, and that captures something of it, but it's really, it has many resonances. It's certainly suffering of the body and the mind. It's sort of frustration, anguish, dissatisfaction, uh, ennui, um, you know, all all the negative states. Uh, and the first principle of Buddhism is, hey, life is like that. Get your head around it. Um, sometimes people think of Buddhism as a pessimistic view. It's not. It's a realistic view. And it's not pessimistic because then Buddhism goes on to say, and hey, there's a cause of your suffering. Uh, understand what it is and let me tell you how you can get rid of it. Okay, so it's actually an optimistic philosophy because yeah, life has its problems. Let me tell you how to solve them. Okay. So the aim of Buddhism then is to uh, move your life, your thinking in such a way as to get rid of uh, dukkha. Okay, now if you left the description there, it would be somewhat misleading mm -hmm. because that suggests that Buddhism is very selfish. Um, Buddhism is about getting rid of my suffering. Each person wants to get rid of their own suffering. And of course, you know, you do want to get rid of your own suffering, but uh, what 
why that is so misguided is that Buddhism has always insisted upon the fact that the aim is not simply to get rid of, of your own suffering, but to get rid of everyone's suffering. So you should be concerned to get rid of the dukkha or other people. That is, you should have this compassion for them. Now, um, why? Well, the virtue of compassion is there from the earliest Buddhist times. Um, but pre-Mahayana, the thought seems to be that Karuna is, is good because it stops you being so self-centered. And self-centeredness is uh, one of the things which causes your suffering. So um, Karuna has a sort of instrumental value. Um, now, what changes with the rise in Mahayana is that that ceases to be the case. It does not have instrumental value. It becomes a prime ethical virtue of Mahayana Buddhism. And if you become a Mahayana Buddhist, you take a vow not to, but, but by this time, Buddhist thinking, enlightenment, getting rid of your dukkha comes by degrees, okay? And there's a kind of an, an ultimate stage, ultimate enlightenment, ultimate nirvana. Yeah. Um, and if you become a Mahayana Buddhist, you will take a vow um, that even when, that you won't enter ultimate enlightenment until everybody does. So you, you vow to work for the end of suffering for everybody. And you're not gonna pull out and leave everybody on their own in a selfish fashion. You are going to hang in there and help everybody else, even though you could pull out, as it were. Mm -hmm. So uh, Karuna becomes the central ethical virtue of Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, let, let me try to grasp what's going on here. So pre-Mahayana Buddhism, karuna is like an instrumental value. That is, you're using it so that selfishness or self-centeredness will be out of the way. It's one of the sources of suffering. As you that, that, the, generally speaking, I think that's the way it's looked on in the earlier forms of Buddhism. Mm. Uh, which is not to say that the karuna is, is unreal. On the contrary, uh, mm. you know, um, it motivates people to act very much. Um, but I don't think it's thought of as a virtue in and of itself, um, whereas this is certainly the case. In Mahayana Buddhism. In Mahayana, it, to the extent that anything is thought of in and of itself, which we, but you know, we've been through that topic. <laughs> right. So uh, I'm just, uh, there's another concept in Mahayana Buddhism, like the Bodhisattva. Is this the person who makes a vow? Yeah, so uh, in earlier Buddhism, uh, the thing to be is an arhat, an enlightened person. So you strive for your own enlightenment, getting rid of your own dukkha. Um, but that is changed when you get to Mahayana Buddhism. So Mahayana literally means greater vehicle. Yeah. Um, and sometimes Mahayana Buddhism refer to the early tradition as, th uh, as uh, Hinayana, the lesser vehicle. It's, it's kind of pejorative. But uh, the difference is that uh, the greater vehicle is greater precisely because it's concerned with the um, Nirvana, enlightenment, liberation of all people. That's what makes it greater. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and the Bodhisattva is a person who has sworn the, the Bodhisattva vow is precisely a person who has sworn to um, aid the enlightenment, divine liberation of all people. And as I said, by uh, the time you get to this point of Buddhist philosophy, um, Nirvana comes in stages. Uh, that there's a path um, and there's an ultimate Nirvana, which you've forsworn until everybody goes together. Oh. But once you've taken the bow, vow, you're on the Bodhisattva path, and then you gradually make progress until you're capable of entering ultimate Nirvana, but you, you, you refrain from doing so. By the time you get towards, you know, traditionally it has 10 stages, and by the time you get to stage eight or nine, you're pretty powerful. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, there's a sort of religious terms, there's a cosmology that goes with Buddhism, and by the time 
you reach the eight or ninth stage, you live in a celestial, you can live in a celestial realm, which is just another planet, really. I mean, Buddhists are materialists about these things, but you're so powerful, you can emanate avatars mm -hmm. to many places at once, and those avatars help people. Um, so uh, there's one very advanced bodhisattva called Avalokiteshvara, who uh, lives in this celestial realm mm -hmm. and sends avatars. And the traditional view is that the Dalai Lama is an avatar of Avalokiteshvara. Mm -hmm. um, well, okay, look, th this is all religious stuff, okay? The, the cosmology that goes with Buddhism, that's religious stuff. Um, so uh, we're not talking philosophy here. Um, uh, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to most Buddhist philosophy. I'm not sympathetic to all this cosmological stuff. But anyway, you know, you asked me about what what a bodhisattva is in Buddhism, and that's what it is. Okay, so what's the relationship of Karuna and the net of Indra? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a derivative one, but let's get the net of Indra straight first. Um, so the net of Indra is a metaphor that plays an enormous role in Chinese Buddhism, um, especially the school called Huayen, but also derivatively in Chan, in Zen. And the metaphor is this. There's this god, Indra, that spread out a net throughout reality. And at every node of the net, Indra has hung a brightly polished jewel. So if you look at one jewel, you can see another jewel, all the other jewels reflected in it. So this jewel reflects this jewel, but of course this jewel is reflecting this jewel. So this jewel reflects this jewel reflecting this jewel, which is reflecting this jewel, which is reflected in this jewel and so on. So I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's like if you get two mirrors and put them face to face and you kind of peek, what you can see is reflections of the mirrors in each mirror all the way down, right? Reflections to infinity. That's, that's the picture of the net of Indra. And what this metaphor is meant to demonstrate is that the, the jewels are a metaphor for the objects in reality. And the fact that each is reflecting all the others is a way that each one is, is meant to show that each one encodes all the others. Each one sort of is what it is because of what the others are. All right. So that's the metaphor. Uh, now, come back to Nagarjuna. As I said, he has an enormous influence on all uh, Mahayana philosophy. And the, these schools of Chinese Buddhism and Mahayana. Um, he thinks... Nagarjuna thinks that everything is empty. Everything is what it is by relating to other things. Other things mean some other things. Oh. There's no suggestion in Nagarjuna that everything is what it is by relating to all other things, some other things. Now, what you get in Huayen Buddhism is that this gets universalized. Everything is what it is not by relating just to some other things, but by all other things. Okay. And that's what the net of Indra metaphor is meant to demonstrate. Every jewel reflects every other jewel, reflecting every other jewel. Oh. Now, how the Huayen get there uh, from sum to all is kind of interesting, but uh, we can go to that if you like, but let's, let's leave that aside because your question was about Karuna. So this, this change from Shunya meaning sum to all, is a metaphysical change, of course. But at least it's possible to argue, uh, and I sort of argued this in one, that it has ethical ramifications. Because um, suppose you and I are, are jewels in the net. Um, then, of course, I suffer, I have dukkha, but you suffer, you're human, um, but your suffering is encoded in my being, as it were.
So if I want to get rid of dukkha, I have to get rid of your suffering as well as my own. So that's the ethical ramifications. I'm, I might add that um, I don't think this is orthodox Buddhist philosophy. Um, it's something that I argue for in one, and it makes sense to me. Okay, so let's now turn to the main theme of your latest book, The Fifth Corner of Four. Okay, so here's the idea of the four corners, or katascoti. I know that you have incorporated a bunch of logical machinery to understand this concept. So let's get into the idea of katascoti now. Okay. Katascoti means literally four corners, four points. And what are the four corners? Well, they're true, false, both, neither. So consider some question. Suppose I ask you a question and you give me a, uh, a possible answer. Um, there are four possibilities. What you say is true, what you say is false, what you say is both true and false, or what you say is neither true nor false. Now, this is a very distinctive view by Western standards because what has dominated Western logic not completely universally, but it's certainly dominated. Our two principles of metaphysical logic, which are the principles of non-contradiction and the principle of excluded middle. Uh -huh. Excluded middle says that uh, everything is either true or false. Non-contradiction says that something can't be both true and false. So everything is either true and true only or false. Or every declarative statement is either true and true only or false and false only. Uh -huh. um, and the Chaturishkoti takes on that view. Yeah, there's tr truth only, falsity only, but there are these two other possibilities. Something can be both true and false and neither true or false. So that's the Chaturishkoti. And uh, it's the thought that things can be both true and false and neither true or false predates Buddhism. You find this thought in Vedic scriptures, uh, predating Buddhist scriptures. Mm -hmm. So um, this is not an invention of Buddhism. But uh, it certainly seems to be that the four possibilities certainly seem to be a well acknowledged framework when Buddhism appears. And we know that because in some of the early Buddhist sutras, this framework is deployed explicitly. So in one of the sutras, um, someone says, well, gee, uh, Buddha, um, what happens to an enlightened person after they're dead? Do you think they exist? Buddha says, well, no, I don't, I'm not going to tell you that. So do you think the, the United person doesn't exist? I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> do you think they both exist and don't exist? I'm not going to tell you that. Do you think they neither exist nor not exist? I'm not going to tell you that. So <laughs> the Chaturishkoti is presupposed. Okay. Now you'll notice that the Buddha refuses to endorse any of them. Most of the dialogue is, is, is left at that point. Um, but there's a question of what the hell you make of that. And that's something which kicks in big time when you get to Nagarjuna. Mm -hmm. So this is where the ineffable comes in again. Yeah, uh, it does. Although um, the connection between that and the Chaturkati is a bit, it's not entirely obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, no, in the Mother Madhyamaki character, what you find is lots of arguments to the effect that things don't have Svabhava. And a lot of the argument is a, by a kind of four-way reductio ad absurdum. So take something you suppose to have Svabhava, like space or time or a person or the Four Noble Truths or whatever. Um, then uh, given that claim, you can uh, divide into four cases. I mean, uh, suppose that this thing has Svabhava. Um, Okay, you, there are four cases to consider. Truth, falsity, both, neither. And what are the, a lot of the argument in, in, in Nagarjuna does is run through the four cases, showing they're all impossible. So it's a kind of four-way reductio absurdum, or reductio ad contradictio. Oh. Sorry, let me rephrase that. It's not a reductio ad contradictio to contradiction, because contradiction is one of the causes. It's a reductio ad absurdum. And oh. some things are more absurd than contradictions. So... The thought that you're a frog is more absurd than the lie sentences, true or false. Okay. Okay. So, 
uh, you've got this hypothesis that something has far power, and then you have this four-way reductio argument. Um, all right. So how does inevitability come into this? Well, this takes us back to our discussion of shunyata and ultimate reality, because it at least appears that in Nagarjuna, he says that none of the four possibilities explicitly applies to the state of the enlightened person after death, which is the same as ultimate reality. That's, you know, pretty much word for word. Um, so since true, false, both and either are the four kinds of things you can say about something, it seems to suggest that the status of the enlightened person after death that is the nature of ultimate reality is ineffable because you can't say any of these things. So that's why it looks as though Nagarjuna is endorsing the claim that there's a fifth possibility, namely ineffability. Okay, so I remember reading your work, The Logic of Kartashkodi. You mentioned about J. Garfield's interpretation where he takes the four corners as a kind of first degree dailment logic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But you're arguing that that's not the case because the fifth corner, that is, it's ineffable, uh, tell, pushes you to a kind of five valued logic, not just a four valued logic like DFD logic. Yeah. Can you tell us something about that? that? that yeah, that, that's right. So um, the Tetris Koti has four possibilities. Um, if this interpretation, Nagarjuna is right, there are actually five. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not actually in contradiction with the Chaturashkoti for the following reason. Um, if you're talking about truth, falsity, both or neither, you're talking about the kinds of things which can be true, false, both or neither. Call them what you like, statements, propositions, beliefs, uh, sentences, okay. That, those are the kinds of things to which the four valued Chaturashkoti applies. Now, if you're talking about things that are ineffable, you can't be talking about those because sentences by their very nature are not ineffable. Mm -hmm. You're they're talking about something. Yeah, they're conventional, right? So these they're conventional. Are... Yeah. Well, not only that, um, but obviously, you know, a statement is not ineffable because it's bloody well there in your face. Okay. If, it's some, if something is ineffable, it's not a statement, it's a state of affairs. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about ineffability, you're not talking about statements, you're talking about states of affairs. Some states of affairs are ineffable. Now, states of affairs aren't the kind of things which are true or false, but there's a kind of analog, namely they exist or they don't. So you've still got the four corners, uh, exists or doesn't exist, or better, its negation exists, but you've got this fifth possibility. So, so the four corner Chaturashkoti applies to statements. The five corner Chaturashkoti applies to states of affairs. Mm -hmm. So there could appear to be a disagreement, but there's not because they're really dealing with different things. At least that's the line that I run in uh, the fifth corner of four. Okay, so it all connects, right? So from the metaphysics down to this logic to the the ethics that we had discussed, there's a kind of philosophy, uh, an overall worldview being offered here. Yeah, well, there are many different worldviews because um, what I've said is interpreted by Buddhist philosophers in many different ways, and we haven't gone into the differences. Mm -hmm. So Buddhism is not a single thing any more than West, East Asian philosophy is a single thing. I mean, there are lots of disagreements. People are against each other, and that's what makes it fun. So even within the Mahayana tradition, there are serious disagreements. Um, but, you know, w way back when we started to discuss, I said that one thing you learn about philosophy is that you get engaged in an issue, and it takes you to another issue, because it's in related. And it, that relates to another issue, so you get into that. Um, so in the end, <laughs> you discover that, Philosophical issues have no svabhava, they're shunya, okay? <laughs> you can, to get your head around them, mm. you've got to engage with these other things. So, um, yeah, I mean, the metaphysics, 
um, the logic, the ethics are, are related to each other in this way. And, and we've only just started because, you know, we haven't talked about the epistemology and uh, the political philosophy, but they, you know, they're lurking in the wings as well. Okay, so on a more personal note, you've been in an academic philosopher for most of your life. You've seen all there is to see in this career. Once being the chair of your department in the University of Melbourne and the other for being the president of the Australasian Association of Philosophy. So you might say you've, you've been really out there in the field, so to speak. So what's your advice to those starting their academic careers in, in philosophy? Mm. Yeah, good question. Especially now. <laughs> okay, so getting a job as a professional philosopher is not easy because there are a lot more people who do doctorates in philosophy who want professional jobs as professional philosophers than there are jobs. And that's particularly true at the moment, just because virtually every university in the world that I'm aware of has been hit hard by the pandemic which means that they're financially strapped for cash. And so, of course, they're cutting back on appointments. In fact, they're, they're sacking people. There are a lot of universities that are, are laying people off, which, of course, means fewer jobs. Um, and this is not going to return to anything like it was before, if ever, but certainly not for the next four or five years. So uh, it's going to be harder than ever for people with doctorates in philosophy to find jobs. So um, first thing is, if you intend to get a philosophy job, you should have a plan B. <laughs> because uh, you may not get a job, so you've got to be prepared to do something else. And it might be being a journalist, it might be a, being a lawyer, it might be going into IT, it might be being a taxi driver, if you love that. Uh, it could be anything. but. Uh, you should be prepared for this possibility, especially because, you know, by this time in your life, it's quite likely you're going to have a family, a partner, kids, uh, and they, you need to live. So that's something that you should bear in mind in your thinking. Okay. That's the first thing. Second thing is this. Um, I said, be a taxi driver if you want, if you love doing that. And that wasn't actually a facetious remark because you should do what you love in life. Well, that's not quite true. If you love hurting other people, you shouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, set that aside. Um, you spend, a, every person will spend a lot of their life working. I don't just mean being employed by someone else. It might be being a, a homemaker. Uh, it might be being a parent, it might be being an academic, it might be being a journalist, it, uh, it might be being a politician, who knows, right? But you're going to spend a lot of your life doing that. And if you don't enjoy it, you're going to be in serious trouble. You're going to spend a lot of your time doing stuff you hate, which is not great. So you should do what you love doing in life. If, you, if there are things that you love doing, and most of us have things we love doing. Okay. Professional philosophers are kind of lucky because the thing they love doing gets them a job. Uh, well, I can't say that that's always true, ever. Um, so return to professional philosophers, which is where we started. What is going to get you a job, if you're lucky, and what is going to help you as a professional philosopher is doing the best philosophy you can. In the end, um, you will do best what you love doing. If you take on something that you find shit boring and just write papers on that, they're not going to be very inspired. Mm -hmm. So um, my advice to young philosophers, in fact, any philosophers, including myself, is to do what you love in philosophy. If you find a topic that engages you, that you find fascinating, that you think you can say something interesting about, do that. Um, don't worry so much about whether it's a hot topic in philosophy, because hot topics come and go. I've been in the profession over 40 years now, 
and I've seen all kinds of crazies come and go from <laughs> Marxism to Derridaeanism to Wittgensteinianism to grounding to, you know, these things come and they're important, they're interesting, and they get kind of worked, there seems they get kind of worked out. So um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to what is currently hot. Uh, pay attention to things which you think are really interesting, really challenging, which you really enjoy thinking about it, and throw yourself into those. Is the career worth it? I'm sorry? Is the career worth it? The career of being an academic uh -huh. philosopher? Is it worth it? That's a very subjective question. Or, okay, so what would you say about your career? Was it worth okay. it? But, but it's a subject, but there's a subject question, but let me, let me answer it. It's a fair question. Okay. I became a philosopher because I loved doing philosophy, right? And uh, I told myself that if I ever ceased to do that, I would get out and do something else. So, you know, I could have become a lawyer or a journalist. Assuming I could have found jobs, but they'd have been jobs that would have interested me. Um, of course, by the time I was in my 50s, it was kind of too late to change horses. Um, but as a matter of fact, um, that situation has never arisen. Uh, I've loved every moment of my philosophical career. I've been teaching myself philosophy. I've been thinking about new issues all the time. Uh, and I, I've loved every moment of it. Um, so that's why I've done philosophy and continue to do philosophy. Um, I hope my philosophical career ain't over yet. There are still many more things I want to write about. Uh -huh. um, so um, other philosophers, well, if you go into a philosophical career and you don't love it, you're choosing the wrong profession. Um, if you choose it and you burn out, which some do, then hopefully you burn out in time to change career. If you burn out and you're too old to find a new career, well, actually the job situation is changing. Getting a job after you're in your 50s is hard now everywhere, I think. But I mean, older people are getting into jobs and moving into new areas, um, perhaps more than this was possible you know, 30 years ago, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, if, if you burn out, then uh, I wouldn't hang in the profession. You're gonna just become a time server, you'll hate it. You're probably teaching, you'll bore the shit out of your students as well. You won't be doing anyone a favour. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I, I think you should get out of it. Give a chance to someone who does love doing what they do. Find something else you love doing and try and, you know, make an income out of doing that. Okay, that's a good piece of advice. So thanks again, Graham, for sharing your time with us. And join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. <laughs>